Okay, so yeah, yeah, I know. We're supposed to be getting into the episode, and by now I'm sure you've noticed the title and everything. But if you don't mind, I'm just going to rant for a second. Because, frankly, things have not gone my way for close to two months now. And it's fucking pissing me off. So I'm just going to ramble to my audience incoherently, like every other fucking YouTuber when shit like this happens. Are we okay? Is that simpatico with everybody? Fine. Perfect. Yeah, so I had this plan of, you know using the space where I knew not much would be on TV to, um, you know, address my backlog. I'd, you know, get to some, maybe, maybe some of the more interesting things, uh, maybe get some Storm Before the Calm rant out again, so on and so forth, and approximately none of it happened. My post-Christmas, uh, high wearing off, which I already addressed in the American Gods video, sucked, and then... The second I started to make another video, I just, you know, slept horribly and didn't have the energy for a good week solid. And then when I did have a decent uh, time of it, I just wanted to relax, so I relaxed. And now, it's been close to two months, and I have no videos to show for it. And here I thought I might have passed 100 subscribers already because of the amount of new content I may be releasing, but I didn't get to any of that. So... Bollocks to fucking everything, apparently, because screw the world. And now here we are at the end of that period, and I have nothing to show for it. Bollocks to everything. So yeah, that gap of between, like, January and April that I was planning on using to actually be productive and do productive YouTuber things, yeah, it amounted to approximately fuck all, and to add to that, that this is the second time I'm recording the second half of this rant, because... Apparently, my software decided to put the second half before the first, so I had to delete it to make things the way they should fucking be. And of course, now here we are in late March, and Legends comes back on on April 1st. Sabrina comes back on April 5th of, of all times, as opposed to, you know, October when it would actually make fucking sense. Which means I've got to do double time to make up for lost time, because... Gotta finish all the Sabrina episodes before Sabrina comes back, and also Legends, so I'm gonna be double booked for months now, when I could have just, you know, been working all this time if it weren't for the fact that my sleep schedule crapped out utterly again, and now, you know, it, the last two nights in a row I've gotten, like, maybe three hours of sleep, and I don't want to make a fuss about it, but it's really harshing my fucking mellow, you know? And... So, you know, best laid plans of mice, men, and authenticators, I guess. So, yeah, I've completely fucked up everything, and everything's been completely fucked up. Fortunately, I haven't been completely idle because a friend of mine has a blog, and he asked me to write a couple articles for him, which probably, in all fairness, hasn't uh, helped much because, well, it's given me some content to talk about, and some things to do other than just sit on my ass for months. Um, it has also resulted in me having to do a lot of typing. And there's a reason I do these things audio-wise and don't script them, because, frankly, well, I'm more organic when I just talk it out. But for another thing, typing takes a lot of fucking time, especially when you have to use your phone. And, yeah, so I've pulled literal all-nighters on those for two or three or four weeks now, to the point that normally I go to bed around five, wake up at two, but instead I'm going to bed at noon at the latest and not even going to sleep until two or three a.m. the next day. And I don't want to complain because it's actually been fairly lucrative and fun to actually write shit again, but it's still fucking annoying. And yeah, I, I've rambled enough, like I said, best laid plans of mice, men, and authenticators, and bollocks to literally everything, just, just dick the universe for all I fucking care at this point, but I am a professional, and I am a entertainer and a YouTuber, so things must go on. The show must go on. The show must go on. And yeah, I also know my singing voice sucks. Don't fucking at me. I'm allowed for my little indulgences every now and then. Fuck you.
But without further ado, enjoy the fucking show for the love of everything. Hold your loved ones close and hopefully don't fail at everything, please. Hello, audience. My name is Dalton Mortimer. I am the Authenticator, and I'm sorry about the uh, previous uh, five minutes or so, but I needed to blow off some steam. Anyway, top of the morning to you, because it is St. Patrick's Day, or at the very least a couple of days afterwards when I'll finally be posting this, assuming that this is only going to be the second time I've had to re-record this, because, well, fuck my luck, essentially. And that's especially ironic when you consider uh, how luck-oriented St. Patrick's Day is. And even more ironic when you consider that even though St. Patrick's Day is one of the few mainstream holidays that doesn't have pagan antecedents, it's still more heavily associated with fairies and leprechauns in particular uh, than it is with, you know, St. Patrick. And that's kind of funny to me, especially because it's probably the exact same kind of joke that a fairy would in fact pull. Like, I can imagine a impish fairy going, Oh, you're going to supplant me with other gods and shit? Well, bollocks to you. I'm going to inspire some PR executive a couple centuries down the line, and it's going to be about me all over again. And boom, we have leprechauns everywhere. Ha 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 ha. Not saying that's how it happened, but I'm saying I wouldn't be surprised if that is, in fact, how it happened. Anyway, getting down to business, because St. Patrick's Day special. As usual, uh, with my specials, I'm breaking this down into three bits, and we're going to cover multiple subjects, specifically the Leprechaun franchise and how it relates to actual Leprechaun lore, the luck of the Irish, because, well, honestly, I just needed something kind of funny and lighthearted to stick in the middle, and there's lots I can ramble and rant about in there, and finally the third section where we'll get more serious, which is the episode I previously talked about covering for my St. Patrick's Day special, which is American God Season 1, Episode 7, A Prayer for Mad Sweeney. Mad Sweeney, of course, being the, uh, the resident leprechaun on American Gods. And yes, in American Gods, basically anything that is ostensibly supernatural is considered a god, so leprechauns count. Anywho, I've adulterated you all with enough blarney for one thing, so as usual, and with hope th this special kicks off a n new streak of me actually being able to produce videos, in we go. To the lore of the leprechaun. For starters, yes, I probably should address something that I said previously and I kind of just left ha hanging, which is that yes, a leprechaun is a type of fairy. A fairy, specifically, is a nature spirit sort of the astral embodiment of plants, trees, and the ambient energy of the earth. See, f fairies largely come from Celtic mythology, much like many, many, many things from our standard bear holidays. Um, and as I stated previously, um, the Celts were unique in that they had a nature-based, horizontally-facing religion, which is to say, whereas... Abrahamic religions are vertical in nature, heaven, hell, purgatory, possibly limbo, etc. The Celtic pantheon was largely horizontally based in the sense that it was thought that nature possessed a veil of mystical energy that separated our world from the so-called other world with a capital O. Um, here is where dwelt the Celtic gods, of which there were two families, the Tuatha de and I forget the name of the second one, because the second one very rarely ever comes up, because it's largely considered to kind of be, you know, evil-ish, well, at least roguish. Um, and also, the offspring of these gods, which were sort of 
spirits of main tributaries and natural elements. Sort of think like uh, the Greek conception of nature imps. That's sort of what fairies are. And there are many, many varieties of them because fairy is a dimension more so than it is a specific race. Therefore, there are fairies that are trolls and goblins, which are massive and unruly. There are sprite-like fairies, the ones that everyone is most familiar with, the t Tinkerbells and the like. And there are various varieties of impish little diminutive men and or women, like the English brownie, the hob, um, the kobold in German mythology, uh, the divone is another one, and so on. And of course, Ireland's sort of contribution to the mix is the leprechaun. Which, incidentally, the word leprechaun doesn't actually appear until fairly late in the uh, medieval game there. Mostly because... It comes from Old Irish, such as the Leprechaun, and there are several other varieties that I'm not even going to uh, attempt to pronounce because I'm not Irish. Um, my family actually hails from Scotland, though, which is interesting. Um, don't don't kill me. I, I know the uh, tensions between Ireland and Scotland can be a little mm, hot under the collar at times. You, you get two people who refuse to be conquered by the Romans and then the English, and then you put them at odds with each other. Who knew what would happen? Anyway, getting getting down to the actual subject of today's uh, section, which is the movie franchise, it gets quite a lot right, and it gets quite a lot wrong. For starters, um, I'm going to have to burst a few bubbles when you consider that, uh, yes, I... Uh, leprechauns are always thought to be wearing green, and this works with their fairy association, because, of course, fairies are the spirits of natural ambient energy, as I said previously. But, traditionally, and by traditionally I mean going back several hundred and possibly several thousand years, leprechauns don't wear green, they wear red. See, like I said, they're more closely associated with the brownie and the hob than they are with other roaming varieties of fairies. Leprechauns are traditionally very solitary, and also, interestingly, they wear leather aprons, which is a detail that very often gets left out. Um, why they do this is because leprechauns mostly apply themselves to trades, particularly shoemaking, um, which we will get into more when I talk about uh, le uh, Luck of the Irish. As to the whole plot of Leprechaun, with the stymieing him by a single, uh, a single four-leaf clover for a century or so, and, uh, not even having to replace the darn thing, I'm gonna have to call oodles and oodles and oodles and oodles of bullshit. First thing, four-leaf clovers are meant to get you the favor of leprechauns and other fairy folk, usually. There are some protective elements to it, but it's mostly secondary to the give-you-their-favor uh, lore of it. Secondly, you could have solved this entire franchise in like five seconds if you had just had an iron bullet, because fairies and most other supernatural things with negative intentions are vulnerable to iron and silver. Lots and lots of things could have been solved in this franchise with some iron and some silver, is all I'm saying. If you have to if you have to deal with pissed off fairy folk, get yourself some iron and get yourself some silver. It will at least protect you from them, if not directly stymie them. Um and this yeah, this franchise really could have been solved with just some iron and possibly some silver. Um <laughs> it's it's kind of funny how they go to such lengths just to get all these odd methods to stymie them and don't even consider the most obvious one, which is get yourself a fucking sword or maybe some iron bullets and kill the damn thing. Um, as to the um, way that they kind of stymie him at the end of the first one, which is sticking him in a well, 
Um, and I'm so happy that Leprechaun Returns retconned out wh- away most of the sequels, because I really would not prefer to talk about Leprechaun in the Hood. Let's just, uh And they do actually acknowledge the two, uh, the two, the Danon connection in, uh, Leprechaun Returns, and the Celtic, uh, knot patterns that do, uh, tend to protect from such beings. Uh, see, the symbols of, the symbols of, uh, Celtic knotwork are very woven with magic, in the sense that, much like a circuit board, most uh, amulets, well, actually, most talismans, I got my terminology confused, most talismans and inscriptions uh, sort of step up the natural ambient energy and modify it to a specific end. And in this case, the specific end is various varieties of good fortune and also protection from various things, including fairies. But, yes, uh, the Leprechaun franchise really could have been solved in all of five minutes. Um, Also, interestingly, everyone and their mother knows about the pot of gold thing, but, funnily enough, in a lot of the older lore, it wasn't gold that the Leprechaun granted, it was three wishes. Now, granted, the Leprechaun is frequently associated with gold, and large hordes of it, which he has accumulated probably from other fairies by doing his various trades and things. Um, And also, there's some lore to suggest that his gold is accumulated from ancient treasures that he uh, pilfered during wartime, because the Leprechaun is also traditionally kind of associated with the, uh, with a other diminutive imp-like creature known as the Red Cap, which is a particular kind of fairy, much like the Leprechaun and the Brownie, that is very diminutive and very um, imp-like, that bathes itself and its clothing in the blood of fallen warriors during battles, hence the Red Cap being blood-soaked and all that jazz. Uh, Funnily enough, most of these other varieties appear in the Spider-Man Chronicles, which I might review someday, but um, as for um, as for the Leprechaun franchise, yeah, um, the f- funny thing about him being stuck in a well is uh, particularly land fairies do have trouble with elements that are not land, and the Leprechaun is a land fairy, even if it's a very solitary one. Um, if if you if you really need to make an association between the leprechaun and other varieties of fairies, um, I would suggest thinking of him sort of like a feral brownie. Um, and yes, the one thing that the leprechaun series does get right is the sort of vindictive personality of the leprechaun. Also, another fun fact: in Ireland, leprechaun is a sort of broad term for basically any imp-like fairy. Um, So they would consider a brownie to be a type of fairy. They would consider a kibbold to be a type of fairy. And so on and so on and so on. Um, Basically any imp-like fairy. In the same way that any any small winged fairy is typically thrown in the category of sprite or pixie, even though um, it could very easily be a will of the wisp, it could be an elemental, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, That's a topic for another day. Like I said, eventually, when I get around to reviewing Spider-Man Chronicles, which I probably should do just because it's so accurate to fairy lore and gives me so much to talk about. Anyway, yeah. um, So them stymieing him with a well does make a certain amount of sense, and I'm surprised they never used the one most hilarious aspect of fairy lore, which is to say, all fairies must stoop to count either grains of sand, uh, grains of rice, or uh, grains of wheat. Which means you can sit a pile of wheat or sand or basically any granular substance in front of them, and they will be forced to count them OCD style. Um, Like, severely, like, monk OCD style. Um, And I'm surprised that never, ever comes up in this series, because given its comedic tone and its absurd nature, you'd think someone would use that to stymie him every now and then. Um, But then again, I'm not, I wasn't around when they wrote this series. If if I had been, there probably would have been a lot more fairy lore involved. 
and there probably might have been an explanation as to why Leprechaun switched from red to green. Um, traditionally, the distinction is fairies that have the power to wander are green, and fairies that are bound to a specific location are uh, t tethered to another color. It's sort of, it's sort of like they blend their energies in with whatever their surroundings are, and since they're nature spirits, the freer they are, the greener they are, and so on. Which, I suppose, makes sense. Um, as far as that goes, I believe that is the end of my leprechaun rant, although I'm going to try and... Uh, look back and see if there's anything else we need to talk about. Covered the not work. I covered the red, not green. I covered why they traditionally wear like leather aprons, and I also covered the sort of weird entomology of the leprechaun. So yeah, we just passed the twenty minute mark. I did not think this was going to be this short. I guess I will have to double up on. A prayer for Mad Sweeney, because I don't expect I'll get very much out of the luck of the Irish. But anyway, funnily enough how things work, and on we move. Ha ha. Ah yes, the nostalgia for luck of the Irish. Like most people in my generation, I imagine a significant proportion of my childhood was spent watching... Disney Channel original movies, and yes, they were cheesy, and they were cliched, and they were, well, just B-rate at best, but they also often, at least in my generation, had a little bit of, uh, a, a little bit of, uh, charisma, a little bit of something extra that they added to the world, unlike today's, uh -huh, uh -huh, descendants, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, who, who, who said that? It certainly, it certainly wasn't me crapping on something that makes Once Upon a Time look well written, which it isn't. Um, anyway, Luck of the Irish. Uh, Luck of the Irish is basically Disney Channel's attempt at a St. Patrick's Day special, which I am now going to ape, because basically I wanted something kind of light and mostly just, uh, observation-based to stick in the middle here, like I had with the Christmas special and Nightmare Before Christmas. So, yeah, much like that, I am just going to use this as an opportunity to talk about plot holes, things that didn't make sense, and things that I found funny. And, yeah. So, yeah, luck of the Irish, it is. Um, the main plot involves a kid named Kyle, who is the school's, like, star athlete thing, um, and he needs to learn about his heritage for a school assignment, and he inadvertently loses his lucky coin, which turns out to be his family's luck, and finds out that he is a leprechaun. Also, side note, like, the luck makes him able to quote-unquote pass for human, and that's fine, that makes sense, it's basically a glamour and all, but like, um, why does it make him 6'2"? This I this I find a little bit ironic, considering that leprechauns in this movie are very, very small. They are quite literally the little people. Like, they're not midgets or anything like uh, the leprechaun in the leprechaun franchise was. They are, like, two to five inches tall, maybe. Um, and yet, when it makes him able to pass for human, he's six two when you would think passing for human would be something closer to the average height of 5'10 in the U.S. Uh, but then again, what do I know? Maybe I'm just bitter because I'm 5'4 and I find that to be completely normal. Whatever. But anyway, yeah, there's actually a little bit of genuine leprechaun lore in here in the sense that um, there's a whole subplot about making shoes because apparently whenever leprechauns listen to music, they are compelled to dance, and only by being the quote-unquote master of their feet, by making their own shoes, do they escape from this uh, impediment. And also, it is interesting that 
it's primarily flute music and Irish river dance music that makes them do this because of course fairies are known to produce extremely haunting music and in fact there are several Irish fairy tales that involve people dancing themselves to death. Yeah, side note, fairy tales are fucked up. Like that like everyone is high on the Disney versions of things and it's especially ironic when you consider that I'm currently talking about a Disney version, but um yeah, fairy tales were originally horror stories, and if you read the original Brothers Grimm fairy tales, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. You can literally dance yourself to death, because this m music basically gets you magically high. Anyway, um, other interesting elements are uh, a subplot about uh, potato chips, because apparently the grandfather is very wealthy, in this family because he owns a potato chip manufacturing company and funnily enough they introduce a uh, kind of a culinary folk legend along with all the Irish shit which is to say there's a story about a short order cook um, making fried potatoes for this one patron and this one patron um, finds that his spuds are cut too thickly and not crispy enough this enrages the short order cook with the short temper. Haha. Uh -huh. If he was actually a leprechaun, that would be funny. Um, although, in fairness, this happened in, I believe it was Saratoga, Georgia. And the short order cook in question, in reality, was black. So, there you have that. But anyway. Yeah, the short order cook gets enraged because the patron is rather disrespectful to him. So, he says... Well, I'll show you crispy potatoes. He slices them thinly, deep fries them, and the rest is history because they become known as Saratoga chips, and lo, the potato chip is born. It's funny that they conflate this with, um, with Ireland because, of course, the potato famine and all that jazz, but, um... It's even more funny when you consider that this movie actually does a pretty decent job of, like, when you take out all the all the leprechaun stuff, talking about, like, Irish immigration and indentured servitude and slavery and that sort of thing. Which really gets, um, which is really funny when you consider how much that probably gets under the collar of the modern social justice set. Um, because, of course, uh, they want to say that, um... They want to say that Irish were only ever indentured servitude and not a single person who was of a white race was ever a slave, ever. Which is wrong, just going back to, like, the Greco-Roman empires and things. But even in America, the Irish did, yeah, they were more commonly indentured servants, but they were still slaves. Um... Which is something a little odd to be throwing into, like, a Disney movie, but, like I said, these, uh, the Disney Channel original movies did have some welly every now and then, so, um, good, good on you, I guess, uh, late 90s, early 2000s Disney. Um, also, interestingly, um, because in this movie, the luck is... The, the coins are synonymous with their luck, which makes a certain level of sense, because what use would spiritual beings have for um, actual gold, unless the gold itself was charmed with luck? And that would also explain why, you know, leprechauns were so frequently associated with luck. Anyway, um, getting, getting back to my point, um, in this case, the... Luck is bound to a single coin, therefore if a leprechaun has a hoard, that is synonymous with having an abundance of luck, and also stealing luck from other leprechauns. And there we have the rest of the plot, when his coin is not only lost, but stolen, and is stolen by an evil leprechaun, who has been hoarding a bunch of different families' lucks in a pot, which actually generates its own rainbow, which I thought was also cute. Again, it's an absurd Disney movie, but at least there's some attention to detail and some, you know, attempts at making decent lore out of it, which is nice. It's something that you don't even get in a lot of, Holly like, proper Hollywood movies a lot of the time, so to see it happen in a Disney movie is a little weird. 
still, anything that will give proper lie to any social justice narrative is fine by me, so, you know, red, red, red pill those youths, Disney, of, of the late 90s and early 2000s, red pill them but good, um, and that way maybe when people go, well, black people were on the only subset of people's ever slaved, therefore we need to pay reparations, they can go, yeah, but what about the Irish, though? And then listen to the backpedaling of a thousand social justice ideologues. Anyway, so slightly uh, got sidetracked there. Another interesting uh, thing that happens is uh, mentioned only in passing, but it's an interesting thing when you actually look into it, like I did in preparation for the special, which is at one point when the villain is being particularly villainous, the elder, the eldest of the family of leprechauns calls him a Fulderig, which is, and yeah, I know, I probably butchered that because it's old Irish and I am not. Um, yeah, but Fulderig means, uh, or refers to a specific other variety of spirit, which is slightly more, slightly more uh, malevolent than your uh, standard leprechaun. And as we established in the previous section, that's saying something because the actual behavior of the leprechaun in Leprechaun is somewhat uh, reminiscent of an actual pissed off leprechaun. Don't piss off fairies, kids. You will uh, you will live to regret it, or or not, as the case may be, depending on how thoroughly you piss them off. Um, but yeah, if Roderick is a other Irish uh, folk spirit, uh, slightly closer to a goblin and more male malevolent than a standard leprechaun, which explains why that would be kind of a leprechaun slur for each other. Lol. The idea of leprechauns having slurs for each other amuses me greatly, but anyway, that about covers the uh, luck of the Irish, although there's one last thing I want to cover, and just because I find it funny. When the coin is taken and he's less able to quote-unquote pass for human, his hair starts going orange. This amuses me greatly. Because that implies that, what, all gingers are leprechauns? Although that would explain why they have no souls. I mean, if you're already a spiritual being, why would you need an extra spiritual element of a soul? I mean, thinking about it, if you're a spiritual being entirely, then you're basically all soul, as long as we're extremely generous with what the definition of soul is. In actual mystical circles, there's a distinction between a soul and the rest of your spiritual body because the spiritual body is considered to have layers, but that's neither here nor there. Um, yeah. And on that note, I guess I should sum up my overall thoughts on Luck of the Irish. It's very silly. Let's let's be entirely honest with ourselves. It's absurd and, and silly, and I find it kind of stupid that every Disney protagonist is the most, like, benevolent overachiever jock character you can get to, but I still like this movie. There's still more effort in it than you'd think there would be put in, and I miss that Disney a lot. And on that note, let's move to my favorite faith member of the Fair Folk, that being, of course, Mad Sweeney of American Gods fame. Um, as far as leprechauns go, I think he might be my favorite in pop culture. Um, and yeah, he amuses me greatly. A leprechaun without his luck, it's one of the saddest things ever, but it's hilarious, though. And on that note, a prayer for Mad Sweeney. So ending us off, we have American Gods Season 1, Episode 7, A Prayer for Mad Sweeney. And is it any surprise to anyone that my favorite character in American Gods is the leprechaun, and that my favorite or one of my favorite episodes of the series is about the Leprechaun, and more importantly, that said Leprechaun was written by Neil Gaiman. I don't think it should be a surprise to anyone, honestly. Um, if you all know me, you know how I feel about Neil Gaiman, and how I think he is probably the greatest storyteller we currently have, like, you know, living and shit. So that surprises no one, or at least it shouldn't. Um, more importantly, though, yeah... Mad Sweeney was a recurring character on the series, so they thought they'd give him a backstory episode, and in so doing, because, you know, this is a story about gods and the various lores surrounding them, 
they did a bang-up job of doing a St. Patrick's Day episode and also doing a Leprechaun lore-saturated episode. And wherever there's to be found lore in fantasy shows or shows of any particular genre with a bunch of occult shit in it, there shall be an authentication. So let's do that, then, shall we? Today, that mechanism comes in the form of a more-than-usual extended flashback or coming-to-America story told throughout the episode. The coming-to-America in question is that of Essie McGowan, an Irish servant girl who, through her faith in leprechauns, becomes far more than that. We open with her sitting by a fairy mound, and this is a perfect opportunity for me to pop my head in and explain some shit. C. As with many of the monuments of the pre-Christian uh, or pre-monotheistic Celts, the purpose of the monument was to sort of act as a amplifier of the natural existing energies of a place and become a bridge between our world and, again, the capital O other world, which is the world of the Fae and the Celtic gods, but more explicitly that fit. It's interesting because in a lot of um, pre-monotheistic cultures, the lesser spirits are often more um, given more dignity than the higher-ups because, uh, y you know, if you're, going to, if you're going to ask for something, you're probably going to ask for somebody who's closer to your level, closer, to, more attainable, as opposed to a uh, higher-up. I mean, if your cell phone starts bugging out or you want to upgrade it, you don't talk to the CEO of the cell phone company. No, you talk to the secretary or some arbitrary worker that they hired because, you know, that's more reasonable. And also those people are more accessible. I think to a large extent with uh, the Celts, the same was true of the Fae. You could trouble, you know, Brigid or Loch or um, one of the other to out the den, and if you wanted to, or you could do the rituals to get yourself a house bounty and have him take care of it. Now, granted, there are some bigger things that you might want a big assistance with. That's why, you know, there are invocations for things like gods in general, and, you know, in Christianity you have angels you can evoke, but you can also evoke archangels, demons, you know. The, the lot, basically. Um, I, I think that's kind of, I think that's kind of funny. Anyway, got, got sidetracked. Um, and in the, back to what I was saying about the, uh, fairy mounds, and in the case of the Celtic lore, that often took the, uh, that often took the form of basically just mounding the earth and adulterating it with stones in the appropriate places to kind of act like a mystic transformer to focus and refine the energies. That's why often you would see those mounds become quote-unquote infested with fairy folk, and that's also why in a lot of older fairy stories you, you heard them referred to as the people of the mounds, or mound people. It's not something we often think of because in our parlance, and by us I mean um, probably to a large extent the English, um, the Americans, and basically anyone post-Celtic, uh, th the fairies tend to roam, and the fairies that we're most familiar with are probably the domestic fae that take residence in households, which is a whole nother uh, issue for a whole nother day. Probably when we get around to St. Pat- or to Spiderwick Chronicles, I'll talk about symbol tech, but that's neither here nor there. Moving on. So, back to Essie. I found, uh, I found it interesting that even though in this scene while she's a little girl beside the mound, she's told of many varieties of fae, it's leprechaun that she latches onto. And I guess given that, again, in the informal context, any diminutive uh, impish sprite is referred to as a leprechaun in the Irish uh, parlance, that makes a certain degree of sense. But the upshot for us is that she learns how to make offerings to them. And she does, several years later, when she is a young maid 
looking for the love and the romance. Thereby, she takes out a piece of very rich cake, she ties a strand of her maiden's hair around it, and she tops it off with a gold coin, which is all the wealth that she currently has to her name. Now, like I said, there's no real use for non-physical entities to have gold, but there may be a mystical reason, and I'm going to venture to somewhat explain that. See, in magical circles, as with any energy, magical energy interacts with various materials in different ways, and is also comprised, or rather, and also comprises those objects in particular ways. So it's very possible that it's the energy of the gold that they can weave into the ability to obtain quote-unquote luck um, that they are after. And that might also be why this particular variety of fae is known to hoard gold, because if they thrive off of a particular kind of energy, then, you know, they're going to get as much of it as possible. It's also possible that the giving of the gold gives a jolt to this energy, in the sense that if you ascribe energy to a thing, the hermetic principle of energy flows where attention goes applies, and not only does the natural ambient magic of the land get funneled to this gold, but so does your particular energy that you are filtering essentially into it and through it, giving it a little extra oomph. Anyway, long mystical uh, techno babble cut short, she makes an offering to the leprechaun to have a romance, and they pull through. The problem being, once you've gotten the attention of the fair folk, and this kind of applies to just about any spirit, you kind of need to remain on good terms with them, otherwise they may uh, go off you. And when a fae goes off you, who oh boy, um, do they go off. Uh, in the sense that she forgets one evening to leave out the customary saucer of cream, and yes, that is a standard, like, offering for most fae folk. You leave a saucer of cream on a window or by your bedside or any number of other places and they are supposed to take the energy of the cream and they apparently like this about as much as we presumably like, you know, good, solid cream. Um, anyway, she forgets this and her love dries up rather quickly in the sense that she's betrothed to a person, um, but then her mother finds then uh, the guy's mother finds out, and because she's shooting above her station, our dear Essie gets accused of thieving and thrown onto a ship for transportation. Transportation being an antiquated uh, legal practice whereby America and Australia and New Zealand were kind of used as dumping grounds for criminals. Um, basically, instead of being hung or killed, you would be sentenced to transportation, whereby you would be taken on a ship like cargo, basically kind of like a slave ship, and you would be left indentured to a person, or enslaved to a person, depending on the severity of your crime. Though that is uh, skipped over a little bit in this episode, and I didn't particularly like that, because yes, certain amounts of Irish people were actually enslaved as badly as black people were. That's simply how it worked, I'm sorry. But yes, they t stay focused on uh, on indentured servants because, well, we've got to tell that party line, and it's a little sad when you... C comparatively, the Disney, uh, the Disney Channel original movie is slightly ballsier than you. And I, yeah, I said comparatively. They don't actually acknowledge the Irish slavery thing in Lark of the Irish, but it's relative to what you know, a kid show can get away with as opposed to what a, you know, high-end, uh, prestige cable show can get away with for adults. They're two different thresholds, and it, given those two different thresholds, I think Lucky the Irish was a little bit more ballsy with it. Um, anyway, so yeah, she gets sentenced on to transportation because she forgets to leave out her offering and everything goes south, but she takes up the offering again while she's on the ship, and eventually they pull, 
the leprechauns, and by leprechauns, it's very heavily implied to actually be Mad Sweeney in this case, um, pull through for her again, and she ends up falling for and seducing the captain of the ship. He takes her back to England with him, her dead is erased, and she's allowed to live the high life as a shoplifter and a thief for a couple years, because she figures, if they think I'm a thief already, I might as well actually be a thief. And all of this well until she once again forgets the offering one night. And it goes to shit yet again, and she winds up in debtor's prison. Um, enter the visual uh, confirmation that it was Mad Sweeney in particular that was helping her all along. As he's sitting in the next cell, she tells him kind of just her backstory by virtue of just talking like cellmates would talk. And says that she would now be content to be content, and she has no desire to any longer live the high life. And more importantly, she leaves behind her last ounce of food, which he then takes as an offering and grants her her last wish. Fairies are very mercurial creatures. You piss them off and they will fuck with you. You tow your line and you'll get favors from them. But then again, that's kind of true of just about every kind of spirit that has any, you know, moral agency or or personal latitude to them. You, you can make the argument that angels aren't like that, but I personally have the suspicion that angels are like that too. They're just less uh, overt about it. Anyhow, she uh, tells or tries to tell her children about the stories of the Fae, like she's been passing them down all her life. This does not work, so for lack of a better term, it ends with her. But in the process of her most latest skirmish, she gets transported again, finds a landlord to serve as an indentured servant. Um, all is well, she seduces him, and... Mad Sweeney eventually shows up once one last time to be a ferryman to the next life for her. He, you know, what's referred to as either a Grim Reaper or a Zygopump. Grim Reaper is kind of a misnomer because there's not much grim about it, but a Zygopump is any spirit capable of transitioning a person or an entity from this life into the next one. Though I've never seen leprechauns act as zygopumps, but that might just be creative license on the part of the writers. Then again, if leprechauns and fae are all that she believed in in her life truly, then why wouldn't it be a leprechaun that zygopumps her? Who knows? And thus, we also find out how Mad Sweeney came to America, because this happens... Her death being, her death happens in Virginia, and he comes to America with her to help her transition to the next life, and he stays. And so we find how Mad Sweeney came to America, because of course, in order for gods that are not native to America to come to America, they must be brought by people who believe in them, apparently. And there we have the crux of the majority of American gods. And also the backstory for Mad Sweeney. Though, I'm not done yet, because there is a present portion of A Prayer for Mad Sweeney, and it really doesn't have very much to do with him. But what it does have to do with is he's t he tells us that he was a king, specifically a king of the Tuatha Dé Danann, who, on the eve of a monumental battle, looked into a fire and saw his own death. He ran, and for his... Uh, for his cowardice was turned into a bird, trapped in a stone, and then later trapped in a tree as punishment. The Irish gods were a little bit creative with their punishment, shall we say. And as for everything else, um, that bit comes from the legend of uh, Bail Strudet? I can't, I can't pronounce the old Irish, but anyway, there is an Irish uh, folk legend that basically has that as part of the plot, um, and 
his name Mad Sweeney largely probably comes from the fact that it said he was driven insane um, by this vision of his own death, and Sweeney is probably the closest uh, to the old uh, Irish name that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce because fuck your pronunciation, Ireland. Fuck your pronunciation in the whole. Simply put. And I'm being slightly facetious. I have the utmost respect for Old Irish and would attempt to pronounce it. But as we've established in earlier parts of this, I'm not having the best day. And this is the first video I've posted in two months. So it's not going to be perfect. And I'm just going to have to learn to be okay with that. Otherwise, this is never going to get posted. And then it's going to be another month before I actually ever post anything. And no thank you. Not today. I am posting a thing today if it just kills me. I don't care. But anyway, on that on that note, um, that is the end of the uh, lore-relevant shit for A Prayer for Mad Sweeney. There's some plot stuff, but it's not really relevant to anything lore-related. So, for now, we will leave behind Mad Sweeney, who is fast becoming my favorite leprechaun in all of fiction, and we will close up this particular episode of A Mystic Sea Logs. Long in the making though it was, and late though it is. And on that note, I'd just like to thank everybody who has stuck around in the uh, time that I wasn't posting anything. And playfully encouraging me and chortling me um, about not posting anything. It's annoying, but hey, it got, it got me up to get off my ass. I've I've been dealing with some issues and some sleep deprivation and some depression and shit, so that explains why that is, but I already covered that, so I'm not going to tarry any longer. Um I I know I I suck. Let's let's not be let's not be uh too shy about it. I suck and those two months will annoy me for the rest of this month, because now I've got all that work to do. But anyway, on that note, I hope you all had an excellent St. Patrick's Day, and mind the leprechauns, shall we, ladies and gentlemen? Cheers, guys.